Test, Test. Okay. Uh, good evening uh, at Depot. I'm very happy to welcome at our uh, place tonight uh, Corinna Apostol. Uh, she's curator at Tallinn Art Hall. She's also curator of the Estonian Pavilion at the Venice Biennial this year. And she's co-founder of uh, Art Leaks and guest lecturer at Latvian Art Academy. Tonight she will present uh, her new book, uh, Orchid Delirium, An Appetite of ab Abundance, uh, published uh, at Sternberg Press, an Estonian center for contemporary art. And this is, the name of the book is also the name of an uh, exhibition project. And I'm really curious about your explanations and about your talk. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being with us. And yeah, please, Corinna. Well, thank you so much, Dominic. And uh, yes, I want to first uh, start by thanking uh, Depo for uh, hosting my uh, talk this evening. Um, it's a great pleasure to be in uh, Vienna and to also be online with everybody watching at home. Um, and I also want to give a uh, big thanks to the Latvian Art Academy and the Erasmus program for supporting my trip here. Uh, and also to uh, artist Oliver Ressler uh, for facilitating this discussion and collaboration with the depot. Um, and uh, the project Orchidillium, an update for abundance, uh, which I curated uh, this year for the Estonian Pavilion in Venice, is the result of a huge collaborative effort. Um, and uh, I can't begin to thank everybody behind the project uh, but I would like to thank for their support um, the Tallinn Art Hall, uh, where I am a curator, uh, the Estonian Center for Contemporary Art, uh, who is actually co-publishing the book together with Sternberg Press, and the Ministry of Culture of um, Estonia, uh, for uh, their, their support and uh, promotion of the project. Um, and um, I would also like to say personal thank you for a um, few of the people behind the project, um, especially the artist uh, Christina Norman, who first introduced me to the biography of um, Andres Sal, and who uh, I began this um, incredible uh, journey with. Um, and also big thank you uh, to my um, really longtime collaborator who assisted me in all aspects of the show, uh, Kristaps Ansans and my colleague at the Latvian Art Academy. Um, and um, I also want to say I'm uh, here uh, in Vienna now several times. I always uh, have had a great collaboration uh, with the cultural scene here. Uh, and I've uh, called uh, Tallinn, uh, Estonia, my home, and also Riga, Latvia more recently. Uh, and I'm originally from Romania, and um, I also wanted to say a few words because of the situation that is happening right now uh, in, in this area and at the border of our countries, and um, I would be remiss not to acknowledge the terrible attack that happened today um, in Ukraine and all those who um, perished and were impacted by this and uh, I wanted to start this talk by um, condemning what happened in the strongest possible terms and I know for a lot of us the war has been very um, exhausting to uh, listen to the news and I think that's human but we have to keep engaged and we have to keep supporting our friends, colleagues and um, allies um, in Ukraine uh, and uh, uh, be, um, be witnesses and um, condemn what is happening. Um, so um, with this, um, and uh, because my talk today is about botanical colonialisms, um, I want to um, begin by introducing you this project, uh, which started actually, I think now it's two and a half years ago, uh, when um, I first, um, uh, began researching uh, the biography of the botanical artist who was born in Estonia, Emily Rosalie Sal. Uh, she was then um, uh, brought uh, by her partner Andres Sal, who is a 
well-known Estonian writer, cart cartographer, uh, world traveler, um, to uh, Netherlands occupied Indonesia. Uh, and uh, later she emigrated to the United States um, where she was recognized for her, uh, for her talents uh, as a botanical artist. And um, actually this, um, this journey into uh, Emily's world and uh, her life, which uh, is kind of the, the case study of the, um, of the Estonian pavilion and of the related publication, um, began with my, um, you know, curiosity um, uh, not only about her biography, uh, but about her works. And um, I remember I had, um, you know, a lot of trouble uh, locating these works as she had lived in different countries. Um, and uh, my first uh, instinct was to go to Estonian archives where I was unable to uh, locate her works and I later found out together with Christina Norman that her works had been rejected. Uh, there um, to the United States and looking through different uh, museum collections where her artwork was exhibited, uh, notably the Los Angeles Museum of um, Art, Science and History. I was also unable to trace her artworks there because they had been returned to her. Um, but uh, I think for me the kind of uh, aha moment with uh, Emily uh, began when I kind of gave up and I just started uh, looking for her works on these uh, trading sites. Um, and I was very excited to find not the original of her works, but um, a lot of lithographs of them. And uh, some of them are here. And um, uh, similarly to, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, orchid hunters who were, you know, in the 19th century uh, sent to faraway places to, to recover uh, these um, and well col to collect these uh, precious flowers uh, for collectors in Europe, um, I found myself collecting these uh, many lithographs of her work. And um, one of the first things that I noticed is that uh, of course they're beautifully drawn. They show exquisite details of the plants uh, from uh, different stages of, uh, you know, from being uh, from a bulb to, you know, a flowering, uh, you know, beautiful flower. Um, but I also noticed what was missing and what was missing from this was the context. And uh, they're usually presented on these um, white or cream backgrounds uh, that uh, don't tell us anything about the places from which these plants were taken from. Uh, from which they were drawn. Um, so for me, the project began with, you know, what is behind these beautiful images? What is behind this obsession with, with orchids in particular? And um, I singled out this, um, this project and I called it Orchid Delirium because uh, in one of the first reviews of uh, mm -hmm. Emily's exhibition uh, in Los Angeles, uh, the press really honed in on this uh, really rare collection of uh, orchids that her artworks presented. And um, there I noticed that at the time, even though she exhibited these works in 1926, uh, there had been kind of this long-standing obsession with orchids. And this can be traced back by scholars from you know, the 16th century uh, when uh, Europeans were first introduced to uh, tropical orchids um, and can be traced down uh, through history and uh, create this kind of visual language of coloniality uh, here in Europe uh, where they become a symbol of status, of privilege, of um, nobility. And um, I even read accounts where these uh, flowers were traded to be more expensive than jewels, than gold. Uh, which seems incredible now to us because uh, we live in a time where we see orchids everywhere. In fact, if you walk down the street, probably you'll see um, a shop or, um, you know, um, something that uh, a person's window that has these orchids. And uh, they're actually copies or clones of uh, orchids that were once very uh, plentiful and um, thriving in uh, native context um, in, um, in Indonesia, in other places in Southeast Asia. Um, and I was also very surprised to find out that uh, in this original context, some of these orchids can't be found anymore um, because uh, they have been um, 
cultivated and taken so much that they are extinct. Uh, there have been, you know, um, infrastructure constructed um, by local governments over the sites where these orchids um, used to grow. Um, so suddenly from these very, you know, um, I would say simple, elegant, beautiful images, I was kind of uh, immersed uh, in this super complex and entangled histories. And um, I was especially um, excited with this project, which for me has been a lot of, you know, research and um, a lot of learning also for me, uh, to put in dialogue um, Estonia and Estonian culture and history um, together with Indonesia and together with the Netherlands and to kind of examine this tri triangle and to kind of look at the colonial structures uh, behind these uh, power relations through, uh, you know, the metaphor or, of the orchids. Um, and by the way, I should say the title orchidillarium is actually a word that was used in uh, Victorian England in the 19th century, and it really described this, um, you know, um, power of seduction of the orchids. Um, and uh, it was something like the tulip madness uh, in Holland. Um, and uh, for me, tracing this kind of continued fascination and obsession with orchids uh, was really very contemporary. Uh, it was not just something of the past. Um, and of course, throughout the project and throughout the research, I discovered that um, the legacies and the consequences of uh, artists who were engaged in producing this visual vocabulary of uh, uh, botanical coloniality um, and also the decisions made to build certain, um, you know, colonial buildings or uh, certain architecture uh, in the place of um, indigenous forests. Uh, this is something that we're still living with today and this is something that um, usually people don't connect when they're looking just at these, um, you know, beautiful flowers. Um, for example, you know, being um, in, uh, in Venice at the Venice Biennale, you know, you can't escape this uh, you know, reality that w you are standing on a uh, land that is about to go in to sink, you know, to go um, into the water um, in quite soon, with maybe within our lifetimes. Uh, but as uh, one of my uh, colleagues pointed out to me, Dennis Dizon, when I was researching this, uh, not a lot of people know that actually Jakarta is uh, sinking right now. And uh, actually, in, in also in our lifetime, Jakarta will be um, no longer will the capital will be moved um, to Borneo. Um, and uh, if you look deeper into why this is happening, uh, it is uh, because of, uh, partly because of the different uh, methods of segregation and different infrastructure that was built during the colonial period um, that um, kind of uh, created this uh, massive disaster uh, to happen. Um, so, um, in the book where I'm trying together with um, one of my really closest collaborators on this project, the curator Sadia Bunstra, to give you a kind of historical overview of, um, you know, how we got here <laughs> and uh, what, what, why is it important to look at this now. Um, and for me, from the beginning, um, it was very important to, to engage and to create these very meaningful connections uh, with artists and scholars in Indonesia and uh, with Christina Norman, it was part of kind of the ethos of the project. Um, however, during the, you know, years that we spent on it, uh, we realized that we would not be able to go there because of the travel restrictions during the pandemic and so on. Um, so we thought, okay, uh, how do we bring in these voices then into our project if we can't travel there? And how do we translate these many, you know, conversations that we had, all these insights and uh, learning about um, each of our histories? Um, so this book and this project became kind of the site for, um, you know, dialogues, uh, the site for kind of discussions and debate how to present these kind of interconnected histories. Um, and also I should say that this is um, also something that in Estonia it hasn't been discussed, at least not from this angle, one from this uh, botanical angle, from the angle of um, decoloniality, uh, 
um, and also from, uh, from a feminist perspective and from the perspective of uh, women who are living in patriarchal societies and also uh, from the perspective of race. Um, and for us, all of these um, elements were interconnected, the landscape, the coloniality, uh, gender and race all together. So with this publication and with this project, we try to kind of untangle and to kind of highlight the overlaps. And um, for example, what you are looking at here is uh, part of the research where we were looking at you know, what were the possibilities for um, women who were, you know, coming from a modest background, such as Emily Sal, to become emancipated uh, in Estonia. And art was one of the few occupations that was uh, considered appropriate for women at the time. So you had a lot of, um, yeah, young girls such as Emily go to study uh, in Tartu, in Estonia, um, which was then part of the Russian Empire. Uh, also to St. Petersburg, where Emily also studied. Um, and there they could find something, you know, to make of themselves that was uh, something creative. Um, and we also looked at, for example, um, the uh, habit of collection that was happening uh, by the imperial families in Europe and in Russia at the time uh, where orchids were used as diplomatic gifts and were exchanged and uh, this massive uh, um, yeah, uh, worm houses were built uh, to uh, grow these specimens that were uh, you know, brought from different parts of the globe where uh, you know, that were under the colonial empires at the time. And then they were donated to places like Estonia where they were encouraged to build their own, where, where they were encouraged to build their own botanical gardens. Um, and uh, the botanical garden was also something that was very important to us and was this kind of site of um, transformation, of uh, translation of this indigenous um, uh, nature uh, into European culture, where plants were given different names, their taxonomies were changed. Um, also, the meaning of these plants changed as they were transferred from one site to another. So, for example, in indigenous cultures in, in um, Indonesia, um, these, uh, some of these orchids were used for medicinal purposes. Uh, they were not just decoration or something pretty to look at. Um, and uh, these meanings uh, in many cases became lost and this uh, indigenous botanical uh, knowledge was um, erased and then presented as something else as part of you know, this European colonial, um, uh, colonial culture. Um, and um, in the image on the bottom right, um, we found an example of um, a manor house that was a space for uh, Baltic German nobility uh, in, uh, in Estonia at the time where um, one of the military men in Estonia, uh, when he retired, he decided to have his own orchid garden and decided to dedicate himself to um, the kind of growth of orchids and uh, was combining the orchids with um, this, uh, you know, European painting and this lavish interiors. Um, so the, the manor house, uh, the botanical garden became kind of symbols for us and these places that we wanted to evoke in the project. And um, as we were, you know, going on with the research, uh, we kind of wanted to get at, you know, what happens when this uh, subject, uh, like Emily Sal, this woman, as I said, who lived in this patriarchal society, who was uh, by then a subject of um, the Russian Empire because Estonia was not an independent country at the time, uh, how she comes from this, you know, background, and then she, when she goes to Indonesia, uh, thanks to the position of her partner, Andres Sal, uh, she became part of the Dutch nobility. Um, and uh, this transformation was fascinating to us uh, and we wanted to kind of explore it. Uh, and um, when, um, uh, I should say, um, Emily and both her partner were actually very in support of uh, the Estonian liberation and um, uh, we have uh, found some of uh, uh, their writings and uh, a lot of uh, 
several of Andres's novels uh, where he actually uh, makes the comparisons between Estonia's struggle to become an independent nation and also the growing resistance by in Indonesia against the colonial uh, masters. Uh, but nonetheless, um, his choice was uh, to be a photographer um, where he worked in a printing house and then later he was uh, joined the Dutch colonial army and uh, he became a cartographer. So while he was um, going around uh, the islands, uh, taking photographs and also mapping uh, these colonies, also Emily in her own way was mapping this uh, botanical flora um, and they were creating uh, together this manuscript which, was, uh, which you see here on the right which was never published, uh, in which they were describing all this kind of, um, you know, exotic plants for European audiences. Um, the manuscript was written in German, and it was meant to be published for a European audience. Um, so it's very, you know, um, kind of challenging, and we wanted to present Emily in this project, not necessarily as a heroine, but uh, to present her as this kind of very complex figure because both she and, uh, and her partner uh, made different choices in their lives that, uh, you know, through which they became, you know, they had a better station in life and um, they became, um, as I said, part of, of the elite in Indonesia. Um, but at the same time, they still had this, uh, this roots and this... Um, kind of uh, anti-colonial, uh, you know, attitudes that were expressed, especially in his writing. Unfortunately, because her archive was not preserved um, in Estonia, we don't know a lot about uh, her own thoughts. Um, but uh, I can only assume uh, that uh, she was also very invested in this project of, of national liberation. Um, and uh, here in these photographs, for example, you can see one of the few examples of um, Emily, uh, together with the servants that she had in uh, Indonesia, and she was because she was seen and she was seen part of as a Dutch woman almost, uh, and uh, she had this privilege of mobility that other women in Indonesia did not have. She could travel throughout the archipelago. Uh, she could go to mountains to the sites. So on the one hand, um, you know, this is a moment where we can say, yes, uh, she became uh, emancipated, she, even though she was living in these patriarchal structures. Um, but on the other hand, we also have to look at, who, at whose expense. Um, and um, uh, we also managed to recover different photographs where, um, um, that are presented through this colonial lens of course, because they are taken by um, European photographers, uh, which shows this kind of subservient, uh, you know, position in which indigenous people uh, were put there, who was, who were in uh, the service of um, of this elite, and uh, whose names we don't even know. Um, and uh, here on the photograph uh, that you see on the on the right, uh, you have this, uh, you know, a white man who's a gardener. And you can barely see the, you know, his um, his gardeners, uh, who are all uh, locals, who are kind of like blended in the website, in the in the landscape, um, and who are, you know, kind of presented as in the service um, of this person. Um, and um, also another very important discovery for our project was uh, we asked ourselves, well, how did these plants got here? Uh, because in the beginning, Europeans were not very uh, successful in bringing these plant specimens uh, from this very tropical climates uh, to Europe, which has a very different kind of climate. And of course, a lot of these uh, plants were brought and they kind of died on the way. Uh, they were brought on ships. Um, and of course, we have to remember that uh, also on these ships were not only plants, but were also people that were brought as slaves. Uh, animals as well, and all of these things went hand in hand. Um, but uh, we, yeah, we discovered that uh, one of the biggest tools for this kind of uh, green empire building uh, were these Wardian cases, which I'm showing here on the in the left-hand uh, corner, um, that were invented in England. And um, this also became kind of one of the symbols uh, of the show uh, in which we presented this research. 
Um, and in these cases, thanks to this very kind of simple, uh, you know, invention uh, that uh, plants were kept uh, under glass uh, and protected by these cases, uh, they managed to bring, uh, you know, so many specimens, not only orchids, but, you know, um, other very important plants, which then became um, commercialized uh, and became, you know, a very important and very lucrative part um, of, the, of the Dutch Empire. <clears throat> and, um, of course, um, uh, during this project, we are also keeping in mind how, uh, what, is, what was happening then um, in Indonesia also, and all this unrest that was uh, beginning uh, to take root at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, um, also mirrored the unrest that was happening uh, in Europe and, and in Russia, because also uh, during, the, during that time uh, we had um, the revolutions, which also affected Estonia and uh, its own kind of uh, feudal system. Um, and uh, a lot of the manor houses uh, that I showed this beautiful interior from uh, in the aftermath of the revolution were, uh, were ransacked and were kind of were destroyed because they were seen as a symbol of the, of the, of the colonial power, different colonial power. Um, and uh, yeah, here on the, on the left was also one of uh, Andres's book covers, um, which is, um, uh, he wrote two books, White Oath and White Morning, in which he um, described in detail the unrest that was happening in Indonesia, and this was the first time when European audiences were introduced um, to, these, um, um, to these cultures, and he was translating what was happening there for audiences uh, back home. Uh, and actually these books, because of their anti, I mean paradoxically, because of their anti-imperial messages uh, could not be published actually when he was writing them in 1904 or 1908 uh, because of the unrest that was happening in, um, also in uh, the uh, Russian Empire. And uh, they ended up being uh, published many years later because these messages of um, uh, of what was happening uh, in Indonesia were seen as, as dangerous ideas at the time. Um, and um, yeah, and uh, we also, one of, I think the challenges for me with this project was, you know, okay, we have this uh, big archives of um, colonial, mostly photographs, but there is also a lot of paintings, lithographs, and so on. And um, I wanted to show, okay, uh, what what is something, how can we, uh, respond to this colonial gaze, what was on the other side, what was on the ground, uh, where are the kind of um, visions or, or voices of, uh, of people um, living in the archipelago uh, who were in Java when, when Emily was there, you know, going uh, through the mountains and, uh, and collecting these orchids. Um, and um, I mean, actually, I was made aware uh, by, by Sadia there is actually not such a big archive and because, you know, photography is also kind of um, a, a, a tool that was mostly developed in Europe and uh, people there on the ground did not have access or did not want to use the same visual methods, but um, uh, we discovered that a lot of these uh, histories of resistance uh, to, uh, to the Dutch um, colonizers were transmitted orally through oral traditions. Um, and in some cases, we managed to find very rare photographs, like the one in the right-hand corner, uh, where we uh, learned about um, resistance that was um, you know, taking root, for example, in the mountain complexes where Emily was also um, you know, uh, traveling, uh, for example, um, from the Samin people. Uh, who uh, were um, protesting uh, their um, forest being um, uh, destroyed or being uh, transformed in these monocultures uh, for palm trees uh, by refusing to work. Um, and um, I, I was very kind of impressed and inspired by this. So their refusal translated in laying on the ground or just simply standing by the trees that were supposed to be cut down uh, and just uh, refusing to do to do any work uh, for uh, for their masters. Um, and um, another very interesting um, aspect of um, of this resistance and of the 
kind of uh, moments in uh, Emily and uh, Andres's uh, own history um, was um, a tradition that we discovered was this uh, tiger fighting uh, that uh, actually I'm going to show later a clip that Christina is using in one of her films in the project. Uh, so these tiger fights were done in the, um, you know, in the honor of, of the Dutch queen, uh, and they were allowed to be attended not only by uh, the white uh, Dutch um, colonizers, uh, which you see in this uh, depiction in the left-hand corner, uh, who are standing, you know, above, uh, but they were also um, allowed to be uh, witnessed by by locals. Um, and basically, these tiger fights were actually quite cruel. Uh, the tigers uh, were kept uh, in these cages, and then they were uh, they were released. Uh, and uh, basically, the whole thing ended where you know the tiger had to be sacrificed, so that um, it was this kind of. Uh, seen as this purification ritual uh, from from evil, and uh, during one of these tiger fights that uh, Andres uh, witnessed, um, he at some point he has this moment in his travelogue where he's uh, wondering, you know, how long before uh, these uh, these spears that are used to keep the tiger um, encircled and to kill this tiger. Uh, are going to be used on um, on the colonizers themselves, on the Dutch themselves. So I think for us, this was all, again one of these kind of um, key moments of of transformation in his own consciousness, where he's um, yeah, where he's thinking about you know things that actually were going to happen um, in just a few years. Um, and uh, later on, our uh, yeah, our our research uh, took us to. Um, actually to Hollywood and to Los Angeles, although this seems very kind of, uh, you know, it seems out of a movie, uh, but um, uh, actually Andres and Emily, after 20 years uh, spent in Indonesia, they decided not to uh, move back to Estonia, but uh, they um, retired um, in Los Angeles. Uh, they lived in West Hollywood. Um, and actually, thanks to this, um, I was able to trace uh, her works um, because they were uh, presented at uh, this uh, major art museum, which is today's LACMA. And back then, uh, they showed all of her uh, drawings of uh, indigenous plants, um, all 300 of them. And this show was, um, it, it was on display for the public to see for uh, two years, which is a very long time. Um, and um, also, I was very interested, although I'm, I can't get too much into this, but you know how American culture in the 1920s at the time were also was also kind of trying to um, emulate uh, these um, you know European style museums, um, and how this uh, also fascination uh, with the orchids was very alive there. And actually, I was very surprised um, to um, to discover uh, that actually at the at the time uh, when Emily was there, uh, actually the the orchid was considered the official flower of the White House, and uh, then President Woodrow Wilson um, would, uh, was said that uh, he, when he was um, you know, courting his wife, uh, he gave her uh, one uh, orchid every time they met, and um, in kind of, um, you know, in a gesture, uh, she herself for all public events would wear these uh, enormous corsages of four or five of um, fairish orchids on, on her lapel every time they went in public. Um, and of course, this was also the time when the women's suffrage movement was uh, very active in the United States and uh, women were um, awarded the right to vote, uh, which was also important at the time. And uh, yeah, to kind of, um, kind of maybe um, kind of conclude this uh, historical uh, research uh, which is presented in the book uh, that we did. Um, so the story ends basically around the time when both um, Emily and her husband passed away uh, as uh, American citizens. Um, and uh, we were looking at what was happening again, you know, in Indonesia uh, around the Indonesian independence uh, when uh, it was finally proclaimed that uh, uh, the the Indonesia was free from colonial rule, although this was not, you know, um, a given, and there were still a lot of conflict uh, in the aftermath of this uh, proclamation. 
And um, you know, very symbolically, I found this uh, this image where the the portraits of um, you know uh, all these um, um, uh, Dutch uh, dignitaries were being uh, taken out of of uh, the mansions uh, of the of the Dutch mansions in Indonesia, and basically, kind of uh, these men uh, were bearing kind of this weight of history and kind of removing it um, from their from from these buildings. Um, and also actually striking for me was that um, even Estonia had colonial ambitions, so um, Estonia gained its own independence, uh, but afterwards uh, there were actually really intense discussions uh, with uh, politicians um, and, and diplomats uh, that uh, in order to be considered a European country, Estonia itself has to have colonies. So it kind of comes like full circle, and I found these articles where there were actually debates in the 30s in Estonia, uh, which which countries should we colonize? And uh, yeah, I mean this this is this was for me kind of very surprising. Uh, and uh, actually, in this one article, I found it uh, very intriguing that they were discussing to colonize Spanish islands. <laughs> and uh, I think this is, um, yeah, I think this would be very kind of, um, yeah, amusing to read today. But uh, it was actually a very serious discussion. Uh, and um, yeah, for me, it was kind of, again, brought back this kind of um, overlapping and this kind of endurance of this kind of uh, colonial mentality and what does it mean to be European um, at the time um, and this kind of idea of, uh, of, uh, of possession um, of, of territory and um, uh, yeah, I think uh, these discussions again, although they were uh, happened you know over a century from now, I think are still very actual today um, because we're still we're still debating them. And uh, yeah, finally, um, in um, yeah, in the book, um, I kind of returned to this image uh, that is actually from the 1970s. Um, so much uh, later, after um, you know uh, Emily and Andres's death, after um, Estonia's independence, after Indonesia's independence, uh, when orchids were still being brought and being displayed in these live exhibits in. Uh, ethnographic museums. Uh, this is uh, the Tropan Museum in Amsterdam, which is um, actually still um, active today, although now they, you know, kind of address coloniality more, much more critically, but they are still one of the major museums in which uh, these orchids were brought, they were literally taken from uh, their native context and displayed there. Uh, and actually the exhibition orchids that happened in 1971 was one of the biggest kind of Best sellers, blockbuster hit exhibitions, and uh, for for the museums, and um, kind of showing the endurance of this fascination uh, with the orchids. Um, and of course, today there are big debates uh, happening in in the Netherlands, uh, not only in the Netherlands, but in um, many other former um, former capitals of empire, uh, of what to do with these artifacts and um, how should we return them. And with some museums, we see are more reluctant to give up uh, the, the artifacts and the kind of cultures um, that were, were taken from these indigenous uh, peoples. Um, others are much, are much more uh, willing to kind of engage in these reparations. Um, but of course, I mean, for me, like with this project, it's kind of like what, uh, the question is, well, what kind of reparations can we offer now, um, after these landscapes have been forever altered, after these uh, species have been lost forever, after you know uh, these kind of um, colonial structures are still in place, albeit under different guises of uh, corporations who are still exploiting the lands there, uh, and who are still um, you know um, cultivating. For example, we discovered that palm oil was uh, one of the kind of major things that is still uh, being exported out of uh, Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, and um, there are also now also big debates about companies using this palm oil, which is in so many foods that we eat and um, uh, like from Nutella to, you know, <laughs> pancakes. Um, and um, yeah, so how do we, how do we make these reparations uh, today? And uh, when we can't turn back, we've, we've already kind of um, lost so much and uh, 
there are still people living with the, with the consequences of this. Um, so this is kind of the, his, I mean, this is part of the historical research for the project that was uh, presented in the Estonian Pavilion. Um, this year, um, I, you know, in the book I go into many more details, but these are some of the highlights. Um, and uh, now I wanted to turn and kind of show some of the contemporary artistic responses to this historical uh, material, um, which we, um, you know, uh, became very kind of uh, intriguing for us to how to how to deal with this and to kind of how to stress the urgency for this. Um, and for me, one of the most kind of pressing things was that you know Estonia needs to engage in this. Uh, in this discourse about colonial botany that, um, well, first part, it is part of also their history, um, but also to kind of make these connections uh, with, you know, countries outside of Europe, outside of, you know, in the South Asian um, context, which is, you know, um, very much affected by the, you know, climate catastrophe that is happening right now. Um, and uh, also to kind of like reflect on its uh, on its own own history, and to kind of reflect on how even in Estonia these uh, you know systems of um, exploiting the lands and uh, uh, making you know all these kind of extractive industries available in Estonia um, is something that is still happening today. And I'm going to actually connect this to the orchids <laughs> back. Um, but this is um, this is a film that I will show a very clip, a very short clip from uh, by Christina Norman that was commissioned from this project. Uh, it's called Rip Off, um, and in the film, uh, the main um, actress uh, Caroline Posca and um, uh, her sister Pia is playing a double role of being both in the position of uh, the servant and the lady of the manor. Um, and as I said, this manor houses, which are almost extinct in Estonia today because they were destroyed during the revolution, um, are kind of, you know, the site where we were able to film uh, together with Christina and um, uh, where we were able to kind of like recreate what might have been there. Uh, so I will just play the clip for, um, for a few minutes and then I will say a few words more.
Um, so this is the first uh, film in the trilogy, Orchidellarium. Um, and uh, in this film, there is this kind of very intense struggle between um, the lady of the manor and the servant, who for us are kind of both sides of Emily's identity. And um, during the film, which is uh, longer, which you can see in the exhibition, um, there is this kind of transfer of identity happening. Uh, and this kind of uh, servant who is um, in the first place in this subservient position uh, ends up entering the kind of dream world and fantasy um, of, um, of her master, uh, who is an accomplished um, orchid painter. And uh, during this kind of exchange, uh, she ends up uh, taking her um, artistry, her, um, and even her identity. And uh, it's on purpose that we, um, you know, we kind of behind the scenes made the actresses look almost uh, the same because we wanted to kind of have them almost kind of interchangeable um, and to kind of um, speak to this, um, you know, uh, duality uh, and all of the films and also the project has at its core this kind of uh, duality of um, who is um, the colonized and uh, who is the colonizer, who is in the uh, position of power, how these th things are, are reversed and what happens in this kind of uh, cultural transfer and this power kind of dynamic um, uh, between uh, women. And um, all the films uh, have at their center um, uh, yeah, the women's kind of imaginations and their actions. Um, and this is, of course, because we are entering this kind of uh, universe of, of Emily uh, through, you know, Christina's kind of um, imagination and through this kind of almost myth mythical world, which is, you know, it's still here with us, but it also feels uh, far away. Um, and uh, the next uh, film in the trilogy uh, deals, uh, which is called Shelter, deals with the topic of um, incarceration uh, and the tradition of uh, people being uh, put on display as animals, um, which was also kind of very um, alive um, during uh, the 19th century. Um, and uh, the film has its protagonist uh, played by uh, Teresa Silva, a very accomplished choreographer, um, a woman who is uh, the gatekeeper. Uh, she is the one that is, um, you know, putting, you know, taking care of the animals behind the cages. Um, but uh, during the film, uh, we see that she herself becomes uh, entrapped in her own cage. So I will play also very little over this.
Um, so in this sequence, and I should say the films are, um, I'm presenting them in this order in which we conceive them, but in the space of the exhibition, they kind of play off against each other. And also the soundtrack, which was um, developed by Mart Marslil, uh, they're all kind of mixing together. Um, but um, yeah, in this, uh, in this particular film, which was shot on location at the Tallinn Zoo, um, contemporary um, today, um, it was um, uh, the artist's kind of um, desire to kind of create this tension between the two gazes, the gaze of um, the woman who is trapped inside the cage and herself, uh, we see her transforming into this sort of animal. Uh, and the gaze from the outside of uh, visitors, and those are actually genuine, candid reactions uh, to what was happening at the time. Uh, and uh, their own gaze, uh, which kind of uh, has this, uh, this power in the film uh, to, to transform uh, this woman and to kind of uh, entrap her in a way. And um, yeah, uh, I think it's kind of also obvious from the pre my presentation that the, a lot of you know, these images are about this obsession with looking and uh, this obsession with exoticizing not only the plants but also, also the people. And um, actually this is not, um, this was of course happening uh, in Indonesia uh, in throughout this kind of massive visual um, archive of, of people that were being photographed, categorized, racialized, and so on. Um, but also um, in Estonia, uh, like Estonia in, is still in, in, uh, in you know, the previous century, Estonians were called uh, Europe's last savages. Um, and uh, they were um, also de depicted as this kind of ethnographically distinct people. Um, that uh, there's kind of descriptions that, you know, they have certain smells and also kind of all these like racialized uh, epithets um, uh, being, um, you know, um, yeah, being transmitted about them. Um, and uh, finally, uh, the last, uh, the last uh, clip in this trilogy that I will show, uh, which is called Thirst, which is, um, I guess, dealing much more directly with what is happening in um, uh, Estonia today and this, uh, particularly this uh, orchid market that is happening. Um, the film deals with um, the exploitation of uh, peat uh, myers and peat from these marshlands in Estonia, uh, which is happening on a large scale today. Uh, this, and uh, we found that this, um, this um, earth is then being uh, taken uh, in, by companies uh, in, the, in the Netherlands and it is being you know, packaged as this uh, sub peat substrate uh, that is used then to grow uh, orchids in uh, nursery. So somehow it comes back full circle um, and it's not only about the, what is happening out there uh, in Indonesia but it's also what is happening uh, in Estonia today. And um, uh, Christina had a um, very um, good fortune of being allowed to film in one of these orchid nurseries uh, in the Netherlands. And um, the film became kind of this uh, uh, metaphoric mechanized production of these uh, orchid clones uh, that are the kind of copies of um, orchids which once do, grew in Indonesia, in Indonesia and other indigenous contexts. Uh, and that there are then being um, grown with the substrate and then being sold back on uh, European markets. Um, so I'll just show a very short clip uh, from this as well.
are these marshlands where um, the exploitation is happening today. And also in this film, there's a female heroine uh, played by Mary Maggie who is embodying thirst and this land that is kind of depleted of water and resources, um, which is then used to grow these orchids in the Netherlands. Finally, and I'll leave you with this. Um, so after all of this, um, we felt it was um, important to do justice to the project and um, uh, because we weren't, as I said, able to travel to actually to Indonesia or film anything there ourselves, um, except have these exchanges and we thought uh, what better way um, to have these uh, voices from the ground there and um, we uh, invited um, also a dancer and a choreographer, Eko Suprianto, to create an additional film to be in dialogue with this uh, film trilogy which I showed clips from um, and to kind of uh, return the gaze in a sense um, and to kind of um, give us a glimpse of uh, you know, the ways of um, symbolic but also kind of physical embodiments of resistance happening uh, there right now. And uh, Echo, to, with, together with his partner um, Putri Novalita, uh, filmed this uh, incredible film in, was in, in central Java. Um, and uh, it was also shot in, um, in a quarry mine where this kind of exploitation of materials is also happening today. 
Um, and in the film, both of them are showing this kind of different engagement with nature and kind of like returning us to this kind of, um, you know, uh, pre-colonial ways of uh, engagement where there is not this kind of separation, commodification and so on uh, of, of uh, the relationship uh, with, with the landscape. Um, and um, I will just show a very short clip with this and um, end with this.
for me it's hard to like kind of cut it <laughs> without watching it in full. Um, but um, yeah, I'm super grateful to yeah to to Sadia for facilitating this film and to Echo also who choreographed it and. Um, yeah, I think it's, um, for them, it's kind of their attempt to, like, as I said, to kind of shake off the colonial gaze, to kind of present the orchid for what it is, and to kind of show this kind of uh, agile and uh, resilient uh, gesture, um, and to show the kind of like the the fragility of, uh, of the landscape, and um, yeah, uh, of... Uh, Kind of the exploitation also that is happening there there now and and today and um, yeah there's a lot of more things that I could say but I think I'm I'm going to I'm going to end here and um, just say that yeah if uh, yeah if you happen to be in Venice the exhibition is still on until November 29th and um, the book will also come out um, later um, this fall and. Um, Together with um, uh, to, together with the artists and other uh, collaborative uh, um, co contributors to the project, there are also uh, different scholars from uh, from Estonia and uh, Indonesia contributing with uh, with original texts that kind of give even more uh, depth to kind of the fragments that I've laid out here today. And um, yeah, finally, just wanted to also thank uh, um, Laura Papa who designed the. Uh, the the book and the orchid font that I showed um, in the beginning, which has been kind of also a big part of the visual identity of the project. Um, so I think I will stop here and um, I, I can take any kind of um, questions and thanks for everybody for being here and people who are also uh, watching online. Yeah, Not sure how to take questions online, but <laughs> yeah, if there's any. Oh. Go ahead. Thanks. <laughs> Straight to the questions. <laughs> Uh, when I when I uh, saw Christina Norman's uh, work uh, with this part you showed here at the beginning, when the woman carries the plants into the cave, I was a lot reminded to humanity's attempt to create uh, a, a backup for all the seed that's being lost. Mm -hmm. Uh, due to the loss of biodiversity, and uh, yeah, th the most well-known example to uh, get such a backup is, of course, this global seed vault in Svalbard, mm. uh, where um, different seeds and crops uh, have been stored for quite a bit already, and uh, some of them have already been required just because they they got extinct or were mm -hmm. lost more or less uh, outside in our landscapes. Um, but uh, as we know, even this fault is uh, in danger of becoming destroyed mm -hmm. due to uh, the effects of human behavior resulting mm -hmm. into climate breakdown mm -hmm. and in the collapse of the permafrost soil. Mm -hmm. uh, so water was uh, was more or less uh, destroying parts of this global seed vault in Val Svalbard. So uh, in the in the exhibition in the Giardini, I was really um, uh, also impressed how you bring together all these different aspects. And it was also, I think, maybe the only example uh, in the Giardini this year, if I remember it right, uh, that uh, brought together uh, uh, his historical ar archival mm -hmm. material uh, that's the basis of an exhibition and then this is being used for artists to respond to it. Um, as you know, most uh, curators used a much um, 
simpler basis of just inviting one artist uh, to, to fill the, the pavilion. Um, there were also these quite huge texts in the, in, mm -hmm. in the presentation. And when, when I was there, uh, I, I saw that most of the people start reading these texts. You oh, did not really refer to this nice. text. <laughs> were these curatorial texts or was this part of one uh, artistic work? I did not. Uh, yeah, it's actually it's my text. Yeah, it's um, actually we are required, you know, it's part of the kind of, um, yeah, um, participation that the curator writes introductory texts. Um, and uh, I decided because the pavilion has two entrances through which you you get access into the space, um, instead of this kind of you know standard curatorial kind of description of the works, which I think there's already a lot when you get the handout, uh, to kind of create this kind of more poetic, kind of more mysterious, enigmatic kind of um, text that kind of. Um, you know, uh, lure you inside, you know, and uh, the, to be honest, I wrote them, but I can't remember them exactly to this, you know, by the letter, but it's uh, dealing, I think one of the questions is um, about the machinery of amnesia, which is, uh, you know, this reference of um, the histories that have been lost, the knowledges, and also kind of to our own blindness to history and to, to recent history. Um, there is um, also kind of this question that resonated with me and Sadia about how how much has the colonial empire actually ended and how much is still uh, with us. Um, then there's also a question about you know uh, choices and the women's emancipation and what choices that we make lead to. So yeah, my um, kind of yeah goal was to kind of again taking this perspective of the women's kind of subjectivity to kind of open up this, you know, it, because it is kind of also very heavy topics that I think, yeah, we're presenting, um, and to kind of, yeah, introduce through these questions uh, the, the viewer into this. And uh, yeah, pro there's, um, actually, this is my approach. I, I think uh, I like to approach, there's a lot of research that's presented usually and text in my exhibitions. and. Uh, this is also part of my training, but I think we are kind of living in these moments of this kind of historical amnesia. And sometimes it's, for me, it's very fascinating to learn about this and uh, to piece together this kind of multi-layered, you know, international, where there's sometimes voices that don't agree with each other and to lay it out also for the viewer. And um, that's why it actually is just a fragment from, from all the research, but it's, yeah, it's, it's present in the, in the, in the show. And, it's in dialogue with this, with this, with these films, and um, yeah, I also I'm I'm super happy that people are reading them <laughs> as well. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, I think the texts were also quite poetic and open in in some kind, and I know that the project will also continue. Will uh, they also kind of feed in the continuation of the project? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, actually now I'm uh, continuing this, uh, this topic of um, colonial botany and kind of this echo critical responses uh, to it. Um, I kind of, you know, because I'm a writer also, I structured this, uh, this project as different chapters. So this was the first chapter. And actually, as I said, the project started before actually Venice and uh, it just you know, happened that we won the competition and were able to present it there. But um, actually the next chapter I will uh, present um, actually in less than a month from now uh, during an exhibition, um, yeah, also at Apex Art uh, in New York called Flora Fantastic, uh, where I'm also working with artists um, coming from, uh, you know, this uh, colonial context uh, that are either looking critically at history or either reconnecting to this kind of pre-colonial knowledges um, uh, through, through botany. Um, and uh, yeah, and also th this actually, this publication and this book is also a very important part of the project. And uh, yeah, I hope uh, to, to kind of, to continue um, on with this, with this topic. And uh, actually, yeah, one of my also biggest, uh, yeah, dreams is to kind of also present it in, in this context where it is relevant. Uh, so I also want to work more with 
artists um, in Indonesia and, and, and that context, uh, which you know I've had a lot of exchanges with, but I haven't managed to meet in person <laughs> because of different travel restrictions. And um, yeah, I think it's important also to to show it, yeah, in in the Netherlands and also, yeah, I, as I said, in this kind of um, former capitals of empire, um, which are kind of now at the center of these huge debates about um, returning a repatriation, you know, making this kind of um, amends for these damages. Um, yeah, so to be continued. <laughs> Um, actually, I'm very, uh, I'm very curious how the um, work with artists uh, was organized. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, uh, how did you select them, and how much of your research they were uh, aware of, mm -hmm. and um, was there any freedom to which aspects of the research they needed to respond? Yeah, so um, as I said, from the with this particular project, uh, actually, Christina Norman came with me with this idea of exploring uh, colonial uh, entanglements between um, Estonia and other contexts. Uh, and we began kind of digging together into this material. Uh, later on, we invited other, other other artists and contributors to the project, and the kind of like the the research grew. Like even today, I have this kind of massive folders with all these images that I don't have the space to show, you know, even in the exhibition. And um, yeah, I think like we were telling kind of all all of us kind of asked us ourselves what is our own stake in telling this story, who is telling this story, why are we telling this story, uh, and we agreed that cannot be one story, <laughs> that we need to have this polyphony of voices um, in the exhibition that you see kind of like coming together um, in the same space, and um, yeah, as I was more kind of fascinated about this like historical part, and um, yeah, a lot of the artists that I worked with also have this kind of research-based practice, um, but also like they also brought in kind of their own their own context and cultural background, um, and you know some of the research that's presented in the book is uh, done by you know um, uh, scholars in Estonia like Ulrike Plath or Linda Kalundi and um, also Sadia who comes from Indonesia. So everybody was kind of bringing something to the table basically, um, and out of it we decided to yeah. We created this kind of multi-layered, um, you know, project, and uh, I think somebody told me recently, like it's kind of like this, uh, um, not excessive curating, but this kind of like uh, strategy of ex of excess, and this kind of presenting something, not trying to kind of simplify it, but presenting it in its complexity and kind of guiding the visitor or giving hints uh, on how to read this material. Um, but and kind of like making this this kind of like experience uh, for the viewer, um, which I hope translated well um, in in the show, and um, yeah. So and oh yeah, how we selected the artists. Uh, yeah, I mean it's it was kind of like we wanted I wanted to work with artists who were. You know, also uh, when I was um, asked, well, before I got this commission, I was asked, you know, like if I would even apply to this and I said no because uh, I'm not from Estonia, I just live there, I don't feel, uh, you know, like, um, yeah, uh, it's kind of, what does it mean to represent a country, a nation, you know, in Venice anyway. Uh, but then we, I decided to go, okay, no, this should be the kind of cornerstone of the project, the fact that like, uh, a lot of the people involved with it, in it are uh, living in Estonia or connected to Estonia or the Baltics, uh, but they have different kind of their own kind of background which they bring into the project. Uh, so this became kind of also for us, I think when we wrote the proposal that we want to kind of challenge what is national representation and to kind of like, um, kind of a bit break up this kind of, you know, very kind of like, um, you know, one nation, one pavilion um, of the Venice Biennale that's kind of this very traditional traditional model and to kind of open it up for, yeah, different voices um, to come in and, um, yeah. So. Actually, it's, it, it's very f interesting um, uh, because you uh, say voices and the first thing which actually struck me 
that uh, is very typical in this kind of like research or history related artworks to that they're based on human voice mm -hmm. on a narrative mm -hmm. and this thing absolutely lacks any oh the human films you mean voice. yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or probably this ex excerpts you showed mm -hmm. but it, it it brings this um um atmosphere mm -hmm. that actually it's in a way voice literally voiceless mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. also with very you know like dominant, almost apocalyptical soundscape, <laughs> which was <laughs> very, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, like, yeah, uneasy, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, this was, like, also, like, a conscious choice, uh, whether to have dialogue or not in the films, um, and uh, we decided to kind of, like, leave it out because we wanted to bring the historical material inside. And uh, that is already a lot of like different kind of narrations happening. Um, and also like there are moments, I don't know, like kind of the films became their own kind of world and environment. And there is a moment in the film where somebody screams. So there is a voice like, and it's like the person who is um, interpreting in the in Thirst is actually a kind of professional singer. Um, but uh, but yeah, otherwise we want, like I think Christina worked very closely with the choreographer uh, and it was actually a challenge how to tell these stories through the body and through the movement. And uh, yeah, and uh, in a sense it's kind of like, yeah, for me it became even a bit more powerful this way. Uh, that you understand, uh, I think, and you connect, I think, very strongly emotionally with the films, and that's also kind of part of it, uh, even without this kind of dialogue, and then, like, looking at the text and reading these kind of um, poetic messages that you kind of go go deeper, y you can go deeper into the, into the history. Um, and it's also kind of, I don't know, because we, we're also struggling to find Emily's voice in the project because her voice was not recorded anywhere in writing at least. The most I found was some postcards um, that she wrote at, at, at some point. Um, and also like I, I also wanted to bring out like we, we, when we were talking to Christina, the kind of like voice of the orchid and we had like a big discussion of this of how, how the orchid would sound or something but in the end we didn't. But it's mostly this kind of like the orchid gazing back at you and looking back at you and so it became more about this kind of like um yeah enlivening the orchids and the kind of especially in this uh, in this third film it's really about kind of how they're being birthed and produced and machined around and kind of moved and packaged and the kind of how they're kind of uh, at some point in the film there's this kind of massive field um, of, of orchids looking back at you um yeah so it kind of became its own world and device, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, thank Hi. you for your presentation. Nice to see and you. Nice to see you. <laughs> uh, These are my colleagues and friends from Romania. <laughs> <laughs> One of them even from my hometown. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just uh, wondering that you are mentioning the context for the, so like the missing context for the plants at the beginning. And I'm, I was uh, curious about the decision to make this exhibition at the Dutch Pavilion. Yeah. And not the question is not why, mm -hmm. because it's evident, but how. So this was mm -hmm. more like a curiosity how yeah. you managed. Yeah. How did we end it up? Yeah, exactly. there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah actually, this um, it, it kind of, I think it was fate a little bit uh, because. Uh, uh, we, we started this project, it was meant as an exhibition for the Tallinn Art Hall where I'm a curator and it was especially meant for, a, you know, originally for an Estonian audience to get into these stories and we had different case studies planned and so on. Um, and one of the case studies was this Andre Sal and Emily Sal and their connection to Indonesia and to the Netherlands. And then we um, learned about this open call for the Estonian pavilion that it would happen in the Dutch Pavilion by the invitation of the Mondrian Foundation. So, but we already had the project in the works and we said like this is an incredible, like amazing coincidence and that this is kind of the story to tell in this pavilion now. And uh, also because it's, uh, you know, in the Giardini, it's a garden uh, also and this refers to this colonial botany and so on. So, 
um, yeah, and so we won the competition, but there was no like kind of like, uh, you know, they, uh, it was kind of organized by the Estonian Center for Contemporary Art and the, and the ministry, and they already had the kind of the building, uh, you know, independently of us having, having the project. But we just thought like when we were applying that it is kind of like a perfect fit for that place. And I mean, I think it was, <laughs> so in the end. So that's how we ended up there. And it's very rare because, you know, and we're, I think we're very kind of, um, you know, aware of our own privilege of being there because uh, Estonia is one of these, you know, new nations that isn't allowed to build in the Giardini anymore to make presentations uh, there. And uh, this is kind of like this kind of one opportunity for it to be kind of in a more central position uh, from this kind of uh, being, you know, present just in the city. Um, so, yeah, I think, I, yeah, we all felt the kind of privilege and responsibility of what story we would tell in that space and with kind of this mass, massive audience and we wanted to kind of really make it matter uh, for, for that space. Um, but yeah, it was the, the decision of, was of the, of the Mondrian Foundation and, and the Dutch and uh, they, they didn't um, interfere with the selection process or, or anything and I mean, I hope they're happy with <laughs> what they got. <laughs> Yeah. I know. More more comments or questions. <laughs> question? No, Estonia doesn't have its own uh, ex uh, pavilion. No, no. Ah, where is the, the oh, okay, yeah, yeah, this is also a question we got, yeah, uh, it's in the city, it's Melanie Bonayo's uh, project, uh, so they decided to be in, in Canareggio and uh, to kind of do a project in, in you know, it's a f former church there, yeah, they wanted to change things, but that was kind of their decision, yeah, to do that. But I hear the Biennale is kind of not looking very favorably on this kind of exchanges and they don't like when people and nation, you know, nations, you know, kind of exchange places. So I, I think they're kind of trying to discourage this, but I think it's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. More exciting things can happen. <laughs> and um, yeah. Yeah, it was closed uh, completely this year, and uh, yeah, they invited uh, Ukrainian projects in the yeah, in the Giardini, and yeah. But um, I don't think if there's no more questions, I don't know um, how to end the transmission or. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would say uh, thank you, Corina, for your interesting talk. Uh, thank you to the audience here and online. Um, for, for those who are here at the depot, uh, there is a possibility to talk a little bit mm -hmm. more at mm -hmm. the bar, mm -hmm. and probably this is a nice opp opportunity. Oh, um, yeah, it will, oh, yes, no, it will be available through, through Sternberg Press and we will make a, an announcement shortly. It will be available, we want to release it before the end of the, of the Biennale and I know for sure it will also be available online as well. Um, uh, via the, I think it will be via the Sternberg Press and via the, actually the, the pavilion has its own website, orchidillerium.ee, I think, um, and there you can get all these kind of, uh, we put a lot of actually materials there. There's also kind of guided tours of the exhibitions with me and uh, the artists and uh, also this kind of virtual exhibition guide where you can kind of visit the exhibition, you know, as if almost as if you were there and so on and all the the texts that I talked about are there so yeah I think the website is the best yeah yeah thanks <laughs> thanks for asking <laughs> yeah. okay okay thank you, thank you. <laughs>